to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to jesus disciples he made this wonderful promise i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you to myself that where i am there you may be also john chapter 14 verses 1 through 4 we welcome you today to our study of the subject of the second coming of jesus christ this is a part of our Be Faithful series in which we're offering motivational lessons that will encourage every Christian to live faithful to the Lord all the way to the very last day. And friend, one of the things that really ought to motivate us to be faithful is the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, we welcome you today to our broadcast. We're so happy that you joined us for our study of the Word of God together. Today's lessons are brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question or you'd like to know more about the Lord's people, they'd love for you to visit them. And if you have a Bible study or a question, they'd love to have that with you. And friend, also here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in any way that we can. All of our material is available both in audio and video from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We encourage you to visit that. And with all of our lessons, we make copies of these lessons available to you. We'll even ship it free of charge to you in your home. Just write to us or call us or email us at the information given throughout and at the end of our broadcast, and we'd be happy to do that. And as always, we hope you got your Bible and that you're prepared to study the Word of God with us today. You know, as you think about one of the subjects that is replete throughout the New Testament, it is the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been said that the second coming of Christ is mentioned about 318 times in the 260 chapters in the New Testament. Put that another way, something about Christ's second coming is said on average of every 25 verses. Or we could say about 1 20th of the New Testament deals with the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can see that that is a, a very big part, a very important part of the, the New Testament and the message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, what do we know about the second coming of Christ? We know that Christ's coming is going to happen. There is no getting around it. Everybody's going to have to face God in judgment one day, and the Lord will one day come. How do we know that? Listen to the words of Hebrews 9, verse number 28. The Bible says, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, listen now, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Someone once said to me, you know, the Bible never mentions second coming. I beg your pardon, but it does. He will come a second time. There's the second coming. Now, it's different than the first coming. The first time Jesus came was to deal with sin, right? Matthew 1, verse 19 through 21. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. The second time He comes won't be to deal with the sin problem. It'll be for salvation. He'll come back and claim His own. Those who have lived right, done well, and are faithful at His return, they'll be caught up together with Him in the air. And they'll always be with the Lord. And so what a wonderful idea the coming of Christ did. It's something that's definitely going to happen. If you're alive when the Lord comes back, you won't miss it. You'll know what's happened. There'll be the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God. It'll be something that all men everywhere see and know is happening. 
But then let's think about another detail about Christ's coming. And this refers to the timing of the second coming. Friend, there have always been a lot of speculators, a lot of people who like to guess, a lot of false prophets about the second coming of Christ throughout history. And it's one of the ways you can fall, uh, spot a false prophet is that they always try to put a time on the second coming of Christ. For example, uh, Seventh-day Adventist leader and one of the original founders, William Miller, said in 1833 that Jesus would come back in 1843. Ten years he's coming back. Well, 1843 came and went, and guess what? He changed his mind and said it'd be 1844. Well, that never happened either. Charles Russell, Jehovah Witness leader, said in 1914, Jesus is coming back. Well, it didn't happen then. He said, well, it, I got it wrong. It was 1919. Finally, he said, well, Jesus really came, but it was only to his inner circle. Well, if you read your New Testament much, you know that's not the nature of the Lord's coming. And so throughout history, there have been religious leaders who tried to tell us when the Lord was coming. It wasn't too long back, I believe in 2011, a man by the name of Harold Camping, he put billboards across uh, California and other places, and he said, Lord's coming back May 21st, 2011. Well, May 21st. 1159 59 and the clock rolled over and Jesus hadn't come back we knew that wasn't right and we knew ahead of time because the Bible teaches nobody knows the timing of the Lord's coming here's the truth on the matter listen carefully anytime anybody says the Lord's coming back at this time on this day you can put a check mark beside their name and write them down as a liar and a false prophet Now that's pretty bold I know it is but that's what the Bible says. Do you remember Matthew 24, verse number 36? Let's look at this together. Matthew chapter 24. What did Jesus say about the timing of His coming? Well, Jesus made it very clear uh, about the timing of His coming. He didn't leave any room for doubt. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 24. Listen to the words of verse number 36. Jesus said, But of that day and hour... No one knows, not even the angels of a heaven, but my Father only. What's Jesus talking about? His coming in the world and His coming. When's Jesus coming back? Nobody knows. Angels don't know. Only the Father knows that. I know it'll be like this. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, it'll be as a thief in the night. What's that all about? Thief in the night doesn't call you up at 10 till 2 and say, get ready, I'm coming over to rob you, does he? No, he robs you when you're not ready. He robs you when you're not looking. He, you, nobody knows when it's going to happen. That's the idea. Friend, when we think about the timing of the Lord's coming, let's realize that's not something that men know. No one knows the day or the hour that the Lord is coming back. And so what's the message then? Be ready always. Mark 13, verse 35. The bridegroom can come at an hour when you're not expecting him. Matthew 25, make sure your lamp, your oil lamp is trimmed and you've got oil in it, meaning make sure your life's ready when the Lord does come. Because when He comes, that'll be the opportunity to go back and be with Him forever. But then I want to encourage you to think about this. Let's think about what the Lord's coming is going to be like. When the Lord does come, what's that day going to be like? Well, the Bible gives us some details about that day. The Lord's coming is going to be with great power and authority. Matthew 25, verse 31, He'll separate His people, the goats on the right hand, sheep on the left. He'll separate them. It'll be, uh, the King will speak and all will hear His awesome and magnificent voice. It'll be personal. The Lord will come back to claim His own. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. John 14, verses 1 through 4. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. It's personal. He's coming back for me. He's going to come back for my loved ones. It's something that we'll all be a privy to and we'll know has happened. What else do we know about the nature of the Lord's coming? It's going to be unannounced. The Lord's not sending an email or a text or a memo telling people when He's coming. As we mentioned, 
Uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Thessalonians 5 that it's like a thief in the night or like labor pangs upon a pregnant woman. Think about that illustration. Imagine your wife's pregnant. Maybe you've been through it. Your wife's pregnant. You're sitting next to her and all of a sudden she just jumps. What happened? Labor pain. She didn't know it was about to happen. Didn't know it was coming. It just hit her all of a sudden. That's kind of the idea. Like a thief in the night, like labor pains, it's going to be unannounced. Not something that you can say, well, I better get ready. It's almost here. That's not the way the Lord's coming works. On that day, another aspect of the nature of His coming is it'll be audible. You will hear and know the Lord has come. John 5, verse 28 and 29, All who are in the grave will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The, vo- the trumpet will sound. The voice of an archangel. That great shout will be made. And all men will know at that point what's taking place. You know, another aspect of the Lord's coming is that it will be visible. Every eye shall see Him. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Acts 1 verse 11. This same Jesus who you saw ascend will also in the same manner descend. He left on a cloud, He'll come back that way. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And so the the Lord's coming is an amazing event that we all, all Christians, want to be watching and ready for. But you know, along with the Lord's coming, there are some events that will also, according to Scripture, coincide with that. Now let me illustrate that. The resurrection, the bodily resurrection, will take place at the time of the Lord's coming. All who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. When are people going to be resurrected? According to 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, all, again, all who are in the graves are going to come forth. They're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're not going to perceive those who've died. We're all going to be caught up. They're going to be with the Lord just as we are. And so the resurrection, the bodily resurrection, is going to take place in, along with the second coming. Judgment is going to take place along with the second coming as well. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I want you to notice what Paul will say about the judgment in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, notice now, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. When the Lord appears, when He comes back, Judgment is also going to begin as well. I want to make sure I'm right at that time. I want to to be judged uh, according to the Word of God, John 12, verse 48, and I want to make sure my name's written in the book of life, Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15. Friend, we also know that coinciding with the second coming of Christ is the fact that God's vengeance is going to be meted out, given out, to the ungodly. I want you to listen to the book of Thessalonians for just a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul notes that at the Lord's coming, God is going to bring vengeance on the ungodly and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and admired among all those who believe Him because our testimony among you was believed. On that day, those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel, God's vengeance will be meted out to those people. Now God doesn't want them to be lost. Christians don't want them to be lost. God's done everything He can to make it possible for them to be saved. But if they ignore the warning, if they rebel against God and live in sin, there is a day coming when all men will have to give an account for that. You know, another interesting thing that's going to happen on the day of Christ's coming is every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord on that day. I know there are a lot of people who don't believe today. There are a lot of atheists and there are a lot of people who aren't sure or or agnostics about the idea and a lot of people just don't care or don't believe. On that day, all those people will realize the truth 
and they will bow and they will confess. How do we know that? Listen to the words of Philippians chapter 2 and I want you to notice what Paul says about this. In Philippians chapter 2, notice with me verses 9 through 11. The scripture records, Therefore God has also highly exalted Him, this is Jesus, given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus and every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's a day coming when all men will realize Jesus is Lord and Christ. Now, why I mention all these things going to happen with the second coming? Again, this is designed to motivate and encourage. Hey, if I'm living right, the resurrection's a good thing. If I'm living as ought to, the judgment is not a scary day. The fact that God's vengeance has meted out, that's not something I'm going to worry about. How wonderful it'll be to know that every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and Christ. And so, designed to encourage us to be ready for that awesome day when those things will indeed happen. We also know on that day that the kingdom is going to be delivered to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, When Christ comes, He will deliver the kingdom to the Father. Those who are in the kingdom of the church will also go to be with the Father forever. We know that on that day, the righteous are going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, will be changed, Paul said. For our lowly body must put on that immortal, or that uh, immortal body, our corruptible body must put on incorruption. That's the idea. We'll be crowned with a crown of righteousness. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth in the future is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, but not to me only, to all those who've loved His appearing. And friend, listen real carefully. Another event that the Bible teaches will coincide with the coming of Christ is that this old world and all that's in it, the universe, the world, and all that's in it, the Bible teaches is going to be destroyed. How do we know that? Notice in your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Talking about the Lord's coming in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, beginning in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in, all holy, in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Friend, think about this for just a moment. If when the Lord comes back, this whole world and the earth and the universe and everything's going to be dissolved or destroyed, why would you want to put your interest here? Why would you want that to be your main focus? This earth is temporary. The things of this world, they're fading. They're passing. The eternal side, the, the spiritual side, the spiritual realm, that's where Christians want to put their hope and their focus. All right then, let's think about some lessons then that we want to really emphasize as it relates to the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How does this motivate me? What does it help me to do? Friend number one, as I think about the second coming and as I think about the idea of being faithful unto death, the second coming of Jesus reminds me that I need to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Second, or excuse me, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. The Bible says that we as Christians ought to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Second Peter 3, verse 11. Seeing all these things are about to be, what manner of conduct should you be? Live in all holy conduct and godliness. In view of Christ's coming, live like you ought to live. Live soberly. Live a righteous life. Live godly. It ought to affect the way I live my life each and every day. I mean, imagine. I'm trying to live as a Christian. I'm trying to do what I ought to do. If I may remain faithful and stay true and the Lord comes back, hey, that'll be a wonderful day. But imagine if I slip 
if I fall, if I give in to sin, imagine how horrible it'd be if the Lord came back and that's where He found me. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in view of Christ's second coming. Hebrews 12, 14 says it this way, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see God. Secondly, this emphasizes how we need to watch and be ready all the time. I want you to hear the words of Jesus as He spoke to His disciples. He had spoken about the end of the world, no doubt connected to His coming. And Jesus then made the application to His own disciples in the Gospel of Mark chapter 13. Listen to very simply what the Lord said in verse number 35. Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 35, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Friend, there's the idea. Be on the alert. Be watchful. Mentally and spiritually, be mindful that the Lord could come at any moment and be ready for that day. Paul would teach us to be pure and to be blameless in the sight of God. Philippians 1 verse 10, we're to live lives of, of purity. 1 Thessalonians 3 13 and 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, we are to be blameless. Now, I understand that I'm not pure and I'm not blameless on my own. But if I've obeyed the gospel, God has purified me. If I've obeyed the gospel by the blood of Jesus, I've been made holy. And friend, I want to do my part to every day walk in the light. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. And then, friend, as you think about lessons this really emphasizes, how Christians really ought to, ought to put their hope on the second coming. You know, we ought to be looking forward to that day. I think a lot of lessons we hear about the second coming give us times of pause where we want to really stop and examine our lives, and there's no doubt it ought to do that. But for the faithful child of God, shouldn't that be something we're hoping for, we're looking forward to? Listen to 1 Peter 1 verse 13. Peter said, Therefore, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation, the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And so, as a child of God, my hope ought to be set on how God's grace is going to be so wonderfully given to Christians when He comes. Now, as you think about the second coming, not only does it encourage, not only do we want to emphasize some things, but friend, this ought to motivate us as well. Ought to be motivated by the second coming. Motivated to what? Well, here are the things that the second coming ought to motivate every Christian toward. It motivates me to realize now is the time. Remember, I don't know when the Lord's coming. You don't know when the Lord's coming. No one outside of God know, knows when the Lord's coming is going to be. If that's the case, now's the time. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Not yesterday and not tomorrow or not in the future sometime. Right now is the day. Now's the time to get ready. You want to know why that's so true? James says in James 4, 14, What is your life? It's but a vapor. Peers for a little while, then it vanishes away. Now is the key word because that's all I'm promised. That's all I know for sure that I've got is right now. Take advantage of it and be motivated by that to get ready for the Lord's coming. Get ready then would be our second encouragement to you. In Acts chapter 26, verse 28, Along with realizing the importance of now, Paul stood before Agrippa and he proclaimed the gospel. And Agrippa said, Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Paul said, I wish that you were almost and altogether as I am without these chains. Realize the need to get ready. 
This is your opportunity. This is your chance. Don't forget about the example of the ten virgins. When the bridegroom came, five weren't ready and five were ready. The five who weren't ready didn't have their lamp trimmed, didn't have oil in it. They went to the city at the last minute, procrastinators at the last minute, to try to get ready in a hurry. And the door got shut. They didn't get to go in. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Don't say to yourself, I'll do it tomorrow. And then finally, a motivation we have from the second coming of Christ is we need to live faithful every day. Live faithful unto death to the Lord each and every day. Remember again, Revelation 2 verse 10, certain Christians uh, in Ephesus were thrown in prison. Some might even die there. Here's what Jesus said to them. Be faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. Live for the Lord every day. Luke 9, verse 23. Live as a sacrifice to God each moment of your life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And friend, maybe you're not ready for that day. Maybe it's because you've become a child of God, but you haven't lived like you should. Friend, as long as you have now, you've got an opportunity to make it right. Simon was a Christian. And almost immediately, he fell into sin in Acts chapter 8. And yet there was a way to him for him to be forgiven. Peter said, repent and pray to God that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. And Simon said, pray for me. Simon repented. He changed his life. He got right with God. You can do the same thing. If you're an unfaithful child of God or you're not sure you're ready for the judgment day, whatever sin may be in your life, make it right. If you're not a Christian, why not become one? Hear the message of Jesus Christ. Believe that to be true. Uh, make a commitment in your life to turn from sin, turn to God, and confess the beautiful name of Jesus Christ and be baptized in water. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Our hope and prayer for each of us today is that this lesson will motivate us that when, if we're alive and we hear that day come, It'll be a day of joy, not a day of sadness. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. The Gospel of Christ.